Today, um, we are very happy to have Professor Bob Wolf from University of Chicago. And here he will be talking about quantum superpositions of massive bodies and gravitationally limited entanglements. So uh, please start. Okay. And uh, I realize it is 11 p.m. in Japan now, so I will uh, try to keep this talk, uh, well, as interesting as I can, so you can stay awake and finish on time so you can get to bed at midnight. Uh, so this is work, uh, well, it's based on two references, and uh, the further details would, would be in these papers. The first one is one uh, from four years ago with a group of collaborators, all of whom were in Vienna at the time. Uh, several of them have moved on now to other places. And uh, what I'll be talking about the last third of the talk is uh, much more recent work with two of my students. Well, uh, Gotim has now, uh, as of two months ago, finished, or one month ago, finished uh, his PhD and started a postdoc at Princeton. Dane is still uh, with me at, uh, at Chicago. So the general backdrop of the work that I'll be talking about, of course, has to do with quantum gravity and the properties, excuse me, uh, the properties that a quantum theory of gravity should have. Uh, as anyone who has worked in the subject is aware, uh, you the fact that you don't have any background space-time structure if you're quantizing the metric itself uh, makes it impossible to just straightforwardly formulate a quantum theory of gravity by standard procedures that work for other fields. And given how many open issues remain in the formulation of quantum gravity, it's interesting to just consider situations, and that's what I'm going to be doing in this talk, where you have some source, a massive body uh, that does obey quantum mechanics and uh, see what issues uh, would arise. I mean, do you need a quantum nature of gravity to avoid inconsistencies? And if so, do you need gravitons or is it sufficient that the Newtonian field of the body is in some way quantized. So these are the sort of issues that form the backdrop of the work. There was a beautiful Gedanken experiment that was uh, proposed by Mari de Palma and Giovanetti, uh, well, a few years before the first of the papers that uh, I mentioned in the, in the opening slide. And the analysis of that, I think, really sheds an awful lot of light on this issue. So what I'm going to do in this talk, the well, what I'm going to do for the next approximately 10 minutes is explain this Gedanken experiment. I'll do that, you know, carefully and in detail so that the issues will be uh, all clear and then uh, hopefully, and then I will explain, well, the resolution that we originally gave using back of the envelope kinds of estimates. And then I'll describe a much more, the much more recent and much more rigorous analysis of what's going on that also sheds a lot of light on the distinction between the Newtonian field and gravitons, or I should really say in the particular situation that we're considering the lack of a distinction between them, but I'll explain that in due course. So let me proceed with the Gedanken experiment. I'm going to explain that in words first, and then I'll show you a space-time diagram that will, I think, you know, put everything together and make it clear uh, as to what's going on. So as in all good quantum type Gedanken experiments, we have two experimenters, Alice and Bob. The Bob is not me, because uh, we need a really 
skilled experimenter uh, performing this. Alice has to be even more skilled to do what she's required to do, but this is a Gedanken experiment, so she can have all the skills and equipment that she needs. So they are, they, their labs are separated by a distance D, and each of them is in, a, in control of a particle, but they're going to do very different things with the particle. Bob, Bob is going to use his particle to measure properties of Alice's uh, particle, which is going to be doing the more interesting thing. Um, when I say particle, I don't necessarily mean an elementary particle, you know, an electron or anything. Uh, a nanoparticle is fine, you know, where we're focusing on center of mass, degree of freedom. So really any body, uh, you know, can play this role of, <laughs> excuse me, particle. And there's both a, an electromagnetic and a gravitational version of this Gedanken experiment. In fact, I'll talk mainly about the electromagnetic version because that's more familiar and, you know, the, the calculations will look uh, also more familiar. I'll explain the differences in the gravitational version. So in the electromagnetic version, we have ch these particles are both charged. We neglect gravitation. In the gravitational version, the particles are uncharged, and the only thing we're concerned about is the gravitational interaction of Alice's and Bob's particle. Now, on to the what happens in the Gedanken experiment. Well, Alice's uh, particle has spin, and she started way in the past before anything of interest uh, in what's going on with the spin of the particle in the x direction, and she puts it through a Z stern gerlach apparatus, which puts it into a spatially separated 50-50 superposition of a Z spin up and Z spin down state. Okay, and these are these have some spatial separation, but the distance that they're separated is much less than the distance between Alice and Bob. And Bob didn't just kept his particle in a trap and effectively not interacted, interacting with anything prior to what I'm calling t equals zero, which is the time at which the following interesting things occur. So Beginning at time t equals zero, Alice recombines her particle. She sends it through a reversing stern gerlach apparatus. She's got the funds and skills to do such a thing. Uh, and sees and what she checks is whether the, her particle has maintained, the components of her particle have maintained coherence while they were separated. If they've maintained coherence when she recombines them, uh, the spin will go back to the plus x direction. You'll just coherently superpose the spin up and the spin down again in the same spatial location, and it will be in the x direction. But if she, if her particles lose coherence, you know, if they interact with other things and decohere. Uh, then uh, some of the time, and if they decohere completely, 50% of the time, her spin will be in the negative x direction when she measures it. So, of course, she may have to repeat the experiment many times to build up statistics, but she can tell uh, by this uh, recombination and measurement of X spin, whether coherence has been maintained. Okay, so similarly, beginning at this prearranged time, uh, well, Bob might decide not to do it, but the interesting thing for Bob to do is release the particle from its trap. And now, depending on which path Alice's particle took, there'll be a different 
Coulomb or Newtonian field where Bob is. And by measuring the motion of his particle when after he releases it, he can get some which path information. Okay, so now the interesting paradoxical situation is if Alice and Bob both do these steps in less than a light travel time from each other. Uh, because if they do things within a light travel time with, from each other, they can't influence each other. So it shouldn't make any difference to Alice's coherence, whether Bob has made his measurement or not. Uh, but if Bob makes the measurement, Alice's particle, uh, uh, you know, will have to be partially decohered. So is, is her particle going to be decohered? Because if it is, and that's due to Bob, then there's a violation of causality. Uh, and if not, there's a violation of complementarity or, uh, you know, fundamental ideas of quantum physics. So let me repeat this in a more visual way, just to make sure everybody's, we're all on board on what the uh, Gedanken experiment is. So here is Alice's particle that was, went through the original Stern-Gerlach apparatus way back in the past. This is a space-time diagram with forward in time going upward and the Z direction uh, which is the stern gerlach splitting uh, depicted horizontally. And so here her particle is uh, Z split into spin up and spin down. And over here, Bob is releasing his particle from the trap at T equals zero. And if Alice's particle went this way, it'll be closer to Bob, there'll be a stronger Newtonian or Coulomb interaction. So Bob's particle will get deflected more and he can get which path information. Meanwhile, Alice is recombining her particle and completes the recombination and measures the X spin up here. And the question is, uh, is, you know, is the particle maintaining coherence? Because if Bob does his experiment, it can't have maintained perfect coherence. We'll have to figure out how much coherence is lost. Uh, and so she better not get perfect coherence here. But if Bob didn't do the experiment, well, there's no obvious reason why she couldn't get perfect coherence here. But Bob better not be able to influence Alex, Alice because they're all doing this at space-like separation. So let me just pause there uh, for one moment to make sure the uh, Gedanken experiment is clear and I'll be doing in, in the rest of the talk, we'll see what ingredients of an electromagnetic or gravitational field are needed at the quantum level in order to avoid uh, having a paradox and how this paradox uh, gets resolved. And there'll be further implications as well. Okay. Um, can I ask, ask a question? Yes, please. Why Bob's particle feels uh, the difference of the Alice particle location? Because the you, you split uh, Alice particle at time, time equal zero, right? Therefore, yeah. any gravitational field or anything is confined in the future of that region. Yeah. Right. So, but that so, but Bob is in the future of when she split her particle. He's oh, not Bob in, is in the future. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because the splitting all occurred all down here. I, I hope people okay. can see. Splitting first. happens in there before so, people. So there. Bob is seeing what looks to him like a Coulomb or Newtonian gravitational field, but he's seeing a stronger one if Alice's particle went this yeah, way. Yeah, 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 I, I, you know, yeah, yes. Yeah. The splitting so happens he's before measuring, people. See. He's measuring the, new. for all he knows, he's measuring the Newtonian or, or Coulombic effects yeah, of yeah. Alice's particle. 
Yep. Thank you. Okay. Now, this is important to see clearly because, uh, as we'll see later, Bob is also can also be viewed as if Alice follows the protocols as measuring photons or gravitons emitted by Alice, but that's getting ahead of the story. Okay, so to question about that. Yeah, uh, was there another question? Can be influenced by gravitational waves, but Coulombic part of the gravity from the particles. Well, the distinction between the two is a major part of the talk, but the the obvious thing that Bob is, let's say, in the gravitational version, is measuring is the Newtonian field of the components of Alice's particle. These were kept stationary, separated by a distance d for quite some time in the past. That's what Bob sees. Uh, and there is no radiation, you know, emitted, uh, at least as far as Bob can tell uh, in this in this process. Okay, well, I should probably move on if we're going to finish by midnight. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the electromagnetic version first, and then there'll be a few modifications for the gravitational version. But if we follow the electromagnetic version, we're fine. And this first slide is not going to be the resolution uh, of the problem, but is going to, I hope, put people in the right frame of mind uh, for thinking about it, because the initial st state of the system at t equals zero, well, has Bob's system over here in the trap. Uh, he's just about to release it. Uh, that's independent of anything else going on in the universe. It's in a definite state in that trap. But Alice's, Alice's particle is in a superposition of being spin up and on the left or spin down and on the right, as I was depicting. But we shouldn't forget the electromagnetic field associated with Alice's particle. Uh, again, I'm doing the electromagnetic version. So there'll be a Coulomb field of the electromagnetic field corresponding to Alice's particle being at the left and a different Coulomb field associated with Alice's particle being uh, uh, on the right. And that should be included in the state, except that we don't have a Hilbert space for Coulomb fields. Those are really not independent degrees of freedom of the electromagnetic field. But if I formally heuristically think of it that way, then it looks like Alice's particle is already decohered because these are distinguishable Coulomb fields. Bob would be able to distinguish them if he had arbitrary amount of time to measure them. So these states should be nearly orthogonal and Alice's particle should already be decohered by the electromagnetic field. But of course, if this were true, you could never do maintain coherence of any charged body, but that's not the case because, well, this is this formal sort of decoherence, which you know can't be given any kind of you know, true mathematical backing anyway, uh, is what Unruh in a nice paper of uh, 15 or so years ago referred to as false decoherence. Although these are distinguishable electromagnetic fields, if Alice were to adiabatically recombine her particle, these Coulomb fields would go back into each other and there'd be no true decoherence. So this doesn't explain anything in the Gedanken experiment, but I, I thought it was worth 
mentioning this to put you in the mood of the fact that we've got to include the electromagnetic field in the system. Okay, but now let's look at what is really uh, playing a role, direct role in the problem. And for that, we need to get a better idea of how well, just going back to the diagram, how well can Bob measure the different Coulomb fields? How well can he get which path information? And we also need to analyze, which I'll do right after I analyze Bob's part, uh, radiation that will be emitted by Alice during the recombination. So the key fundamental limit on Bob's ability to get which path information is vacuum fluctuations of the quantum electromagnetic field. And this can be estimated as follows. The root mean square of the uh, average of the electromagnetic field over a time t scales as one over t squared. So over short time intervals, a quantum electromagnetic field has enormous fluctuations. We don't notice that though, because we in our daily lives average that over a long time, in which case the fluctuations are very small. But if you take this into account and you just do a back of the envelope New Newtonian estimate of how much buffeting uh, the vacuum fluctuations will do on Bob's particle, you'll see that it will cause his particle to be displaced by Q over M. This is in units where H bar and C are all one. Uh, this is re often referred to as the charge radius. So it's the uh, you know Compton wavelength uh, times Q in dimensionless, units uh, here. So, uh, and interestingly, that's independent of the amount of time, because if you do it for a short time, it gets enormously buffeted. If you do it for a long time, it's not buffeted very much at all. That averages out. It's roughly Q over M over all times. So if Bob is going to get significant which path information, his displacement that he would get without quantum physics from the different Coulomb fields uh, better be bigger than the vacuum fluctuation noise. His displacement is easy to calculate because it's essentially measuring the effective dipole field, you know, the difference between the two two Coulomb fields that are displaced. Uh, and if you ask how big is his displacement, well, that grows quadratically in time by Newton's second law again. Uh, and this is the amount of displacement uh, that his particle will have. So this has to be bigger than that to get which path, significant which path information. On the other hand, there's a major limitation on the coherence of Alice's particle, which is due to the emission of entangling electromagnetic radiation. And well, again, I'll page back to the diagram. That's easy. It doesn't matter. You know, she can maintain the symmetry of these paths, but it's easier, easiest to think about it if we imagine that she does the recombination by keeping one of these inertial and the other one get accelerates uh, for a time to get back uh, coinciding with this inertial path. Then the point is if the accelerating object emits radiation, one can tell from that that the particle must have been on this path. Uh, so any radiation to the extent that it's orthogonal to the vacuum will decohere Alice's particle. So we can estimate the amount of radiation using the Larmor formula, the 
electric field is this effective dipole over the time squared, you know, it's second time derivative of dipole moment. To get the energy, we square that to get the flux and multiply it by the time interval to estimate the total energy. But the total energy is going to come out in photons of frequency one over TA. So the total number of photons is roughly this dipole over TA squared. If she has to recombine very quickly, she's going to emit radiation. If she can do it adiabatically, then she can avoid emitting radiation. Now, if she emits significantly more than one photon, that's going to decohere uh, her particle. It doesn't matter whether Bob's around or not. If she can avoid it emitting, if she, emitting anywhere close to one photon, then her decoherence from radiation will be negligible. Okay, so now we can see what happens in this Gadakin experiment where they both have to do things within a light travel time. And it divides into two cases. One is where, again, in these units where H bar and C are both equal to one, the dipole is smaller than uh, the time that Alice has to do the recombination. In that case, from what we just saw, she's not going to decohere things on her own. She's doing the recombination slowly enough. Uh, on the other hand, if we look at how much displacement Bob's particle undergoes, in the case where the dipole is smaller than Alice's time, we get this inequality, but these times are all smaller than the light travel time. So the displacement will be small compared to the vacuum fluctuations. So the answer is in this case, uh, Alice's particle, Alice will succeed in her decoherence experiment, that is, she will maintain coherence of her particle. And it doesn't matter that Bob is making a measurement because he really can't measure anything anyway. In the opposite case, where the dipole is big, then Alice's particle is going to emit entangling radiation, and her experiment is going to fail. And it doesn't matter what Bob does. It turns out that Bob could actually have measured which path Alice's particle was, went on, but the decoherence is destroyed anyway. So that is the basic resolution of the electromagnetic version of the Gedanken experiment. So what are the key lessons from that? Well, I won't belabor through repeating the things that I've just said, but both vacuum fluctuations of the electromagnetic field and the quantization of electromagnetic radiation are essential for consistent analysis. These being the limitations on Bob's measurement and these being the limit, this being the limitation on Alice's decoherence. And you need both of them in the right amount to get consistent uh, results. Okay, now we're really more interested in the gravitational case. We don't have a quantum theory of gravity, but we do have a nice quantum field theory of linearized gravity, and we can uh, make the same analysis. The vacuum fluctuations now give you a Planck length uncertainty. So Bob better be able to measure things better have a displacement due to the Newtonian field that's bigger than a Planck length if he's going to get which path information. You might think that, uh, uh, you know, we again have an effective dipole from the splitting of Alice's particle as I've drawn. So Bob just has to measure this dipole field. But that's wrong because in general relativity, you uh, can't uh, create a displacement 
of center of mass or in special relativity really uh, that's more relevant you can't uh, create a displacement of this the the center of mass you can't have an isolated system that produces a mass dipole if sorry for all this paging back and forth but if bob if alice's particle goes to the right here alice's lab will have to go to the left by a really tiny amount since it's much more massive to keep the center of mass fixed and bob will not be able to see a dipole the first thing that bob can see is in fact a mass quadrupole uh, so he has a much more difficult job in uh, telling whether there has been a displacement. That's his displacement of his particle will have to be at least this much, uh, or, well, that's what the displacement will be. It'll have to be bigger than a Planck length for him to be able to make a measurement. But correspondingly, uh, Alice is only going to decohere her particle via quadrupole radiation. Now, it's not an accident that the radiation is quadrupole. It's because there aren't mass dipoles possible to create in special or general relativity. So the leading radiation is also quadrupolar. So this is the new formula for the number of entangling gravitons. And if you put that together, you get exactly the same results as in the ENM case, except everywhere that there was dipole in the ENM case, you get quadrupole. If the uh, uh, again, if we require them to perform their experiments within a light travel time, if the quadrupole is small enough, then the radiation won't destroy the coherence of Alice's particle, but Bob won't be able to get which path information. And if the quadrupole is big, radiation itself is going to destroy, gravitational radiation is going to destroy the coherence of Alice's particle, and it doesn't matter what Bob does. In fact, if you analyze it, Bob could have gotten which path information, but that's not really relevant to anything. Okay, so if I were giving this talk a year ago or more, uh, you know, based on the first paper, which the results of which I've just presented, I would have expanded out a few things and that, that would be the end of the talk. But it bothered me since that analysis was done that it isn't it ought to be possible to really just show more rigorously and generally that you don't get any contradiction. Here, we only, in what I showed you, we only made very crude back of the envelope estimates. It isn't clear that when you put in the numerical factors, you really won't get a contradiction. And furthermore, maybe Bob could do a lot better on getting which path information. For example, if you had n bobs instead of just one, uh, since they're sort of overcoming vacuum fluctuation noise, maybe that would improve their ability by one over square root of n. And if n were large enough, maybe you'd now have a contradiction. Now, this is not uh, obviously correct because vacuum fluctuations are highly correlated, so they're not statistically independent in different places and you know that uh, you can't get necessarily get this one over square root of n improvement but it's not obvious that you couldn't get some improvement and that you can never get a violation so that's what uh, dane gotum and i uh, looked at more recently. And to do that, we have to analyze a little more clearly exactly what the decoherence due to Alice is and what the decoherence due to Bob is and their properties. And well, this goes back to the first 
slide I showed, this doesn't make sense because we don't have a Hilbert space of states that includes Coulomb fields. We have to separate Coulomb and radiation, and it's only the radiation that is really responsible for true decoherence. But that separation can be done quite cleanly at infinity. So I've redrawn Alice and her recombination here on a conformal diagram. And the point is that at asymptotically late times, the Coulomb field of Alice's now recombined particle goes to future time-like infinity, whereas the radiation goes to null infinity. And at null infinity, we have a perfectly good Hilbert space of radiation states. And we can ask how much radiation is there on this path? That's some state up radiation state here. What is the state of radiation resulting from this path? And the orthogonality of those radiation states will tell us the decoherence of Alice's particle due to radiation. And there's no confusion from the Coulomb field uh, when we go to asymptotically late times. But if we imagine that Alice's particle is recombined and stays inertial forever, we can bring that result to finite times to any Cauchy surface that goes through an event where Alice's particle has been recombined. I mean, go, could go through later as well. If we simply subtract off the Coulomb field of the recombined particle in this gray shaded region, then we have a pure, we have pure radiation states. And in particular at time sigma, we would have a pure radiation state and the decoherence due to Alice's particle, due to radiation, the decoherence of Alice's particle due to radiation is given by this formula. So that's the decoherence due to Alice. On the other hand, we could imagine the situation, I didn't draw a space-time diagram, but where Alice, in fact, doesn't actually, doesn't even recombine her particles. She keeps them separated, but we have Bob out here making a measurement, no longer time limited. I mean, we're not trying to do things within a light travel time, but Bob over some time, now it's a pure Coulomb or Newtonian field that Bob is measuring. Uh, but if he lets his particle interact with this Coulomb or Newtonian field, depending on which case we're considering, uh, well, he starts it in state B, B naught. If Alice's particle followed one of the paths, uh, it would evolve to B1. If it followed another path, it would evolve to B2. Bob state will thereby be entangled with Alice's. There's no degrees of freedom of the electromagnetic field involved in this. Uh, and the decoherence due to Bob in this situation where Alice doesn't recombine her particle is going to be given by this formula. Okay, but now we're interested in, so with that background, we're interested in going back to the protocols of the Gadakin experiment. And I've redrawn, yeah, sorry for this. So this is my original space-time diagram. I've now redrawn exactly this experiment, but I've redrawn it in a conformal diagram. So here is Bob doing his experiment. Since the conformal diagram shows all time, that also shows Alice splitting her particle, but we're not interested in that. And we assume this is done adiabatically with negligible radiation. And here's the long period of time that she keeps them separated and then she recombines them. Uh, so this is exactly the same space-time diagram and the region of Bob's experiment is 
space-like separated from the region of Alice's recombination, just as I originally said. But now Bob is allowed to do any experiment whatsoever. I've drawn him doing this, but he can measure the electromagnetic field, do whatever electromagnetic field re measurement he wants, as long as he does it in this gray region, which is the region space-like separated from Alice's recombination event. And now the key idea is that I can, because they're in space-like separated regions, I can draw various time slices. And in particular, I can draw a time slice that comes through Alice's region before she starts her recombination and reaches Bob's region after he's completed whatever ex experiment he's doing. And I can then view what Bob is doing, of course, as all taking place below this Cauchy surface to the past of this Cauchy surface sigma two. And in that case, we would say that Bob is measuring the Coulomb or Newtonian field of Alice's particle. Alice, for all he knows, could have kept the particle separated for all time. Uh, it, he'd be doing exactly the same experiment. On the other hand, I can draw a time slice that goes through Alice's region after she's completed the recombination, but goes through Bob's region before he started the, uh, his experiment. In that situation, I can view the electromagnetic field on sigma one as being the common Coulomb field of the recombined particle, which is of no interest whatsoever, and I can subtract that off, plus radiation. And I can now draw some other time slice that uh, goes through, well, the same recombination region of Alice, but goes through Bob's region after he's completed his experiment. And I can consider what Bob is doing as a time evolution problem of electrom pure electromagnetic radiation coupled to Bob's system evolved from this time to this time. These are completely equivalent viewpoints, but in the second viewpoint, Bob is purely measuring photons and gravitons, whereas in the first viewpoint, uh, Bob was purely measuring the Coulomb or Newtonian uh, gravitational field of the body. And now if we just look at the radiation evolution problem, we take the second viewpoint and look at what Bob is doing as interacting with the electromagnetic radiation between this time and this time, then it's easy to see that there'll never be any contradiction in the Gedanken experiment because we're starting now, I've subtracted off the common Coulomb field, I have a genuine radiation state entangled with Alice's spin up and a different radiation state entangled with spin down. And Bob started in with his particle in whatever initial state it was in. And now again, it doesn't matter what Bob is measuring. This state is going to evolve to some, there's no evolution of Alice's particle between sigma one and sigma three, nothing. It's the same time for Alice uh, on those two Cauchy surfaces, but the radiation state psi one tensor B naught will evolve to some other radiation state psi one prime B tensor B one due to interaction with radiation, as will the psi two tensor B naught evolve to this radiation state. But the evolution of this state tensored with B naught to this state is unitary. Uh, 
as is the evolution of this state to this state, it preserves unitary evolution, preserves inner products. So we have this relation, which in, implies that Bob state can never be more orthogonal than the radiation was, which proves that the decoherence due to Bob can never exceed whatever Bob does, the decoherence due to Alice. So if we follow the experimental protocols, it's then obvious in this second viewpoint where we're evolving radiation that Bob is just an innocent bystander with respect to decoherence, that Alice's particle is emitted photons or gravitons. That's what's caused the decoherence. Bob is just making some measurement of these uh, gravitons or photons or gravitons, depending on which experiment we're doing. So he's correlating his state with Alice, but he has absolutely nothing to do with the decoherence. But interestingly, if suppose Alice didn't follow her protocol and she kept her particle uh, separated and recombined adiabatically without emitting radiation at a much later time, in that case, uh, Bob would be the cause of decoherence. Uh, it will have, Alice will find that even though she didn't emit radiation by not following her protocol, uh, the de the, it, it's, her particle is still decohered and the cause is Bob's interaction with the Coulomb or Newtonian field of the particle. So in that case, even though Bob is doing exactly the same thing, in one situation, he's a completely innocent bystander. And in the other case, he's causing the decoherence. So just to bang home this point, uh, if suppose it's a felony, a criminal offense to decohere somebody else's particle. Uh, and uh, it's found that Alice's particle was decohered, and it's found, you know, it's alleged that Bob did some experiment like this, and Bob is being tried for whether he is the cause of the decoherence. The key witness in the case is not going to be the witness who saw Bob release his particle from a trap or whatever he did. That's largely irrelevant. The key witness is whether Alice followed her protocol. Uh, if Alice did follow this protocol, then Bob is innocent and he's released. If Alice, on the other hand, adiabatically combined her particle, then Bob is in for a jail sentence for being the cause of the decoherence of Alice's particle. So the lessons from this are the ones that I previously gave. So this is my last slide. So in this situation that I've been describing, it's absolutely essential that we have quantum properties of the electromagnetic or gravitational field. I mean, the gravitational field is more interesting situation, specifically that we have quantized radiation and vacuum fluctuations in order to avoid contradictions with causality and complementarity. That was really what I emphasized in the first part of the talk. But what, what, what I've just been telling you about with respect to this space-time diagram is that there's actually, well, within the experimental protocols, there's no distinction at all. So in general, there's no clear distinction between entanglement that is mediated by 
Coulombic or Newtonian interactions versus entanglement that results from interactions with quantized radiation. Uh, again, we can view from this point of view, what Bob is doing is he's entangling his particle uh, with Alice's particle due to mediation by the Coulomb or Newtonian gravitational field of Alice's particle. Or equivalently, we can uh, view Bob as just interacting with quantized radiation that was emitted without by Alice, and those viewpoints are completely equivalent. Okay, so I think that gives some new perspectives on, well, what's needed in and the properties and nature of, you know, a, quanta, a quantum theory of gravity, or at least I hope that that may shed some insights, uh, shed some light and give some insights into that. And that's all I wanted to uh, tell you about. So thank you. Thank you very much for the nice talk. So now the session is open for the questions and comments. So if you have any um, questions or comments, please just uh, unmute and uh, speak up to ask a question. Please. Sir, I have a question. Am I audible? Yes, uh, yes, I can hear you. Yes, sir. In 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 the initial case where we in in the in, in the initial case where Alice did not follow the protocol, and Bob and, and, and then Bob invariably caused decoherence in the in the gravitational radiation. Instead, if he but it did not, it didn't. But it need not be the case for the electromagnetic radiation. If we had a vacuum fluctuation of the of the electromagnetic radiation or some other kind of quantum field, which would also entangle with the gravitons, could that suppress the decoherence which Bob could, which Bob would cause to Alice's state in in the gravitational radiation case? Um, well, yeah. Let me get my slides back up. <clears throat> so I'm not sure I understood the question. Um, uh, one thing that you might ask, uh, so uh, you'll probably have to repeat the question, but one thing that might have been a little mysterious in what I said is where in this second explanation I was giving, where vacuum fluctuations were playing a role, the vacuum fluctuations are actually playing a role in uh, making the states psi one corresponding, psi one is the radiation state of Alice's particle follows path one, psi two is the radiation state of Alice's particle following uh, path two, um, those correspond to different classical solutions. In the quantum case, the psi one and the psi two would be essentially coherent states with those classical solutions, but the coherent states fail to be orthogonal for exactly the same reason as the existence of vacuum fluctuations. Uh, so, if there weren't vacuum fluctuations, the you know the or if the vacuum fluctuations were suppressed, the psi one and the psi two would be more distinguishable and more orthogonal. Uh, so uh, the vacuum fluctuations are actually playing a direct role in this you know analysis that's uh, being given here that prevents. Bob from getting which path information because that's limited by the uh, orthogonality of psi one and psi two. So now I think that as I'm listening to my answer, I'm pretty sure that didn't answer your question. So uh, maybe you should follow up with uh, what you wanted to, to ask. I mean, that does say something about what would happen if you reduce the 
vacuum fluctuations that would make the that would correspondingly make these states more orthogonal and increase the decoherence due to radiation of Alice. Yes, sir. So, so what I meant was, in the in 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 in, in the situation where Alice does not follow the protocol for the for the electromagnetic Coulombic interaction, we still had a condition wherein Bob did wherein Bob did not necessarily cause the decoherence, but for the gravitational radiation. No, no uh, uh, Bob. If she doesn't follow the protocol and adiabatically recombines the particle, then Bob will be the sole cause of the decoherence. There'd be no decoherence if not for Bob, and the decoherence will solely be due to Bob's interaction with the Coulomb field. Okay, so that answers my questions. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, I think it's high time. So if there's no further questions, then let's thank Professor Bob Ward again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, everybody uh, in Japan or neighboring countries get a good night's sleep. Uh, I'm <laughs> to go off to work now. Okay. <laughs> yes. Good night. Good night. Uh,